Hi there, my name is Sherry Moore and I will be your instructor this semester for the Introductory Biology for Allied Health course, Bio 156. As you know, this is a hybrid course, which means the majority of your work will be done online through Canvas. The only part that you will have to come to campus for is your laboratory work each week, which is on Wednesday evenings from 6.30 to about 9.15 every Wednesday night. This is your first lecture of the semester. We will be going through chapter one in your textbook. If you haven't received your textbook yet, then read back through the syllabus and um, get the information on how to find your textbook because we'll be utilizing an e-text to this course and there are several different formats for you to choose from. So go back to your syllabus and take a look at how to get the textbook so you can follow along with this lecture while you're reading chapter one. Okay, let's get started with chapter one. Here we go. This semester we'll learn about the story of biology and really about the story of you. The definition of biology is the study of life, but I find that's pretty vague, don't you think? As we move throughout the textbook and the course, you're going to see that it encompasses quite a lot of specific fields, including genetics, which we will focus a great deal amount of time on since it's the basis of all life. Biology is more than just plants and animals. We'll touch on a little bit of plants here and there, but plants as a group on a whole are not going to be directly studied in this particular course because we want to focus on humans and human health and human medicine. In order to study life, we need to understand what life truly means. All life is comprised of very specific properties. It's the specifics of each property that make us different from each other. You have probably noticed that I have listed two different chapters here in this PowerPoint. The last slide was the introduction to chapter two, chemistry of life. And this slide is outlining chapter 12, diversity of life. These two chapters really should be uh, melded together into one chapter, in my opinion. They're very closely related material, and so I'm going to present them together for you. I will do my best to note when we're on chapter 12 and when we're on chapter 2. For the most part, the lecture will be from chapter 2 with a little bit of diversity of life from chapter 12 uh, thrown in here and there, okay? Uh, so if you can't find information that I'm talking about in chapter 2, flip over to chapter 12 and see if you can find it there. Okay, I uh, will move on. We'll go back to chapter 2 and we will talk about the classification of life.
how do we know if something's alive or not? This may seem like an obvious question. We know when something's alive or it's not. But when it gets down into um, organisms that we're not so familiar with, um, such as types of bacteria, for example, or if we have a an organism that has mimicry, which means it might look like something that is not alive when in, in fact it is, um, sometimes it becomes a little more difficult to tell. So we can always run something through this criteria of properties of life to tell us whether or not something's alive. So when we talk about order, we mean that the organism has physical structure to it. Whether it's a multicellular animal like humans, which is obviously more relatable to us than something that's single-celled organism, um, we have our internal structures that make up our bodies. And so we have this nice order to it. We're not all random and haphazard, as I like to say. Likewise, as organisms of life, uh, we respond to our en environment, whether it's a external environment or an internal environment. We have the ability to respond to it. Uh, this is how we f show whether we're hot or cold or if we are um, responding to something that's hot or cold. You'll see these um, actions evident in all walks of life. Reproduction is probably something you're familiar with. You've heard your whole life because you yourself have been um, a product of reproduction. So it's just where you have um, an organism that is able to uh, create an offspring of some sort. Sometimes that's with a mate and sometimes that's without a mate. Adaptation is, again, we need to adapt to our surrounding environment uh, to make sure that we're our most optimum that we can possibly be. An optimum body is one that is um, highly advantageous as a species, as an individual. Um, it's always our goal, and we'll talk some more about that um, as time goes on. Number five, growth and development. Obviously, if you're going to be born this little infant, you're going to have to grow and develop. And hopefully you do that in such a way so that you will grow at a proper recognized rate and that you develop in an organized, expected way. Anything outside the realm of expectation in this regard um, could indicate that there's something wrong with that being. Regulation is where we have to regulate our internal body, again, to meet within its internal environment as an optimum uh, goal that we strive for and also as a regulation in relation to our temperature. And you can see where there's some overlap in some of these areas. <coughs> homeostasis is something that you'll hear me harp on all semester long. Um, homeostasis, in my opinion, if you don't have the first six, then you're not going to have homeostasis. Homeostasis loosely means that you're, you as an organism are in harmony with your outward environment and then your inward environment. Your internal workings all have to work as a balance with each other. If one is not working right, then it can affect the other one, and it can have this snowball effect. The same thing happens with our outward um, relationship to our uh, environment. It's usually considered more of an internal compass, if you will, than um, an outwardly one, but it does relate to this um, sensitivity and response to your environment as well. And then finally, number eight, all properties of life, or excuse me, all organisms of life <laughs> are going to have to be able to process energy. 
if you're not processing energy, you're again out of out of whack from your homeostasis, you're a little unbalanced, um, you might not grow and develop appropriately, you might not be able to adapt readily or, or reproduce in any way, um, and you might not be able to sense change and respond to it. So these eight uh, criteria are what make up life as we know it, as, as we consider it in biology. Now that we've defined the parameters of all life, Let's back up a step and further see what life is made up of. When we discuss what makes up life, we start with the smallest unit of life and work our way up to the largest part of life. So what do you think the smallest unit of life is? Cells? Tissue? Organism itself? Nope, it's what we call atoms. I'm sure you've heard of atoms. And I'm sure you've heard that atoms, wait a minute, aren't really the smallest unit of life. We always heard that there was something more. Well, you're right. If you take an atom and you split it open, then you have subatomic particles. And we'll talk more about those next week. But yes, atom is what we consider to be the smallest unit of life, or of matter, not necessarily of life, but of matter. Atoms are considered the building blocks of life. They will combine as molecules. And then as a groups of molecules form, they make up what's called a cell. As cells form together, they create tissues. And as groups of tissues come together, they can make up organs and organ systems. And then we finally get to the whole organism. Groups of organisms are called a population, and then populations are called an ecosystem. And then groups of ecosystems make up the one biosphere that we have, which is our planet. And it also includes everything from the Earth's surface all the way up into the atmosphere. So that we have one biosphere, we have many ecosystems. Ecosystems are things like the tundra, rainforest, the desert, um, the Arctic. Those are all considered ecosystems. And within those, every species has populations that live in one or more ecosystems. So it's just another way that we can classify life on Earth and make sense of it because we have such diversity in life on the planet that sometimes we need these guidelines to help set us straight of what it is that we're actually looking at. This is just a quick visual representation showing how we can take um, all the components of our Earth and break them down into the smallest unit, which is an atom, and work our way up as we group larger and larger and larger into the one biosphere that we have. This picture may look a little crazy at first, but when you look at it in depth and you can kind of see how we can go from the smallest unit of an atom all the way up into these populations and ecosystems and um, finally into the biosphere. So I kind of like this picture even though it looks a little funny. So we've shown how we consider whether or not something is alive, and then we can show how um, there are classifications of the smallest unit all the way up to this large unit that encompasses all of life. Um, but now let's talk about how science classifies living organisms. This is called taxonomy. It's just a classification system. And as you can see by the picture, it's got this beautiful, what I call mountain lion. Um, 
and you'll see to the right of the picture it says puma, cougar, painter, catamount, mountain lion, mountain screamer, Mexican lion, and apparently there's three, 33 other names for this one specific animal. Well, that can get incredibly confusing, as you can imagine. So, over the years, um, from like the 1800s forward, uh, we have come up with several different classification systems, and the one that we've stopped with right now um, is our current system that we'll talk about. Um, I'll give you the the steps to it in just a minute, but I want to show you how this particular organism, this mountain lion, is called a puma concolor, and that is the scientific way of calling this animal. So if you were in a group of scientists and uh, you said, hey, what do you think about that puma concolor? You know, because we all talk like that, right? Um, you know, you would all know, hey, she means a mountain lion. Or wait, was it a painter or a cougar? Oh wait, that's all the same animal. This is why we have this classification system because it makes it so much more simple. And we'll talk about it in the next slide or two of how we come up with these names. But for now, know that a classification system of organisms is called a taxonomy. Just by reading this slide, you can see how necessary it has become that we have this taxonomic or naming system. There's no way that we could all memorize every species known to man and or find every species known to man. Um, there are new species being discovered every day as this shows. And um, in the next slide, we'll talk about how that grouping of organisms um, has come to be. In order to place all the diverse organisms into a classification system, various levels of the system had to be made. This is, system moves from the largest, most generalized aspect of the organism down to the smallest, most specific aspect of the organism. As you can see in this chart, the classification of a dog begins with the most generalized aspect at the top and then works its way down into the very specific Canis lupus species or dog, which is what we're familiar with. So as you notice, at the very top of this chart is our largest category, if you will, called domain. And in this case, our domain is Eukarya. And this domain encompasses all the organisms that fit into what we have classified as Eukarya. And I'll give you those classifications in just a little bit. But you can look at this chart and go, OK, not having known a lick of science ever, or, or any of these organisms for that matter, you can see that they all have something in common enough to put them in this domain Eukarya. Then we go a step down into the kingdom, and you can see some of the um, previous organisms have been left out. Um, there's no more paramecium, and there's no tree here. So that must mean that the rest of these organisms belong to the kingdom Animalia because they share specific traits, whereas the tree and the paramecium did not. Then we just work our way down. Each category downward 
uh, will whittle away more and more organisms until we're getting more specialized. So for example, if you jump down to class, if we're talking about the mammals or the mammalia class, um, all the organisms here, dog, wolf, coyote, fox, lion, seal, mouse, human, whale, and bat, all belong to the mammalia class. Notice we took out fish and snake. Um, but those can be further divided or categorized into carnivores, which is the order, carnivora. Dog, wolf, coyote, fox, lion, and seal. Those are your carnivores of this group. Now, obviously, these are not all the animals known to man in this one little slide, but this is just the example of a dog. So keep going a little further. Um, we see family canidae, which just means that there's um, what most resembles as a dog. So dog, wolf, coyote, and fox are thrown in there as well. Then we skip down to genus, which uh, would be the dog, wolf, and coyote, and then the species of just dog and wolf. So the coyote actually has a different species name to it. So a dog and a wolf are both called Canis lupus. And you'll notice that we repeated Canis from genus above in with the species name. Now typically, you would just see here, um, you would hear, see the word lupus. That's the more accurate depiction of what a species in this instance is called. Um, when we talk about an organism, we list or say the genus and species names together. So we have the genus Canis and the species Lupus, and those organisms, the dog and the wolf, are going to be called scientifically Canis Lupus. And that's basically the gist of how we call organisms in science. Now when we are writing Canis and Lupus, there's very special ways to write genus and species. Genus is always capitalized, whereas species is lowercase, and they're both together italicized. And most science classes and most scientists will have your head on a platter if you do not follow these written rules. So capitalized genus, lowercase species, you write them together, genus and species, in italics to um, indicate a specific animal or organism. I'm sure all of you have heard mnemonic devices um, in the past, either in high school or wherever you had learned it. Um, but there's the one that I like to do is that uh, we take the first letter of each word in this classification system and we give it a word. And that's just to help trigger us of the order that these all go in and um, the first letter of the name that we're trying to remember. So the one I learned was, Dear King Philip came over from Greece singing, and then I always add his common name. And I add that in there because the common name is going to be dog or a common name of wolf. And that's usually how we go around as normal humans, not scientists, talk about organisms, right? We're not going to say, oh, look at this little Canis lupus that I just adopted. Isn't he lovely? No, you're going to say, look at this cute little puppy or this little dog that I uh, adopted. So that's why I add on the common name portion of that. So it's, dear King Philip came over from Greece singing his common name. And I encourage you to find your own um, devices that help you remember these things. You know, it's whatever makes you learn. That's what you need to go to. This works for me because this is what I learned when I was a kid. And yes, I still remember it today. This is just another way to emphasize how much diversity we have on life. When you start thinking about all the animals that you can name off the, just the top of your head, even if it's the common name, um, it gets astounding by how much we know. And then when 
you start adding in plant materials or plant life that you know expands it even more and so I kind of like this little slide to show that there's different ways that have brought about this need for um, coming up with this taxonomic uh, nomenclature. Another way we classify things is by a group's evolutionary traits or genetic relationships. It's called a phylogenetic tree, which is what you see here. And so one way you can kind of um, look at this chart is that it's showing you a rabbit at the top. And I'm not even going to try to say that name because I don't know how. It starts with an O <laughs> and ends with a Gus. And so you can, let's say you have this group of organisms sitting in a box in front of you, and you're going to ask yourself, okay, who has hair? And let's say you've got a rabbit and, I don't know, a puppy and a horse or something. Um, you can group all of those together because they all have hair. Well, as you can see on this chart, we can whittle our way down by asking specific questions. Um, which animals in the group have amniotic eggs? Which ones have legs? Which ones have a hinged jaw? Which one has a vertebral column? So these are new ways of um, separating out organisms, and it's by the way they outwardly physically look. And so that's what phylogeny um, typically relates to. We've also added in, as of late in the last, I don't know, 75 years or so, we've also added in the evolutionary common traits. So as you can see, there are many ways to classify things. And depending on your branch of um, science that you're in, you'll use one uh, type of organism or excuse me, of classification than you would maybe over another kind. So a few slides back, we talked about the domain. And that particular one for the dog was called Eukarya. And it's E U. K-A-R-Y-A. E-U just means true, and so in this case we've got a true organism. Um, there, there is one other type of um, domain name, and we call that prokarya. So we've got eukarya and prokarya. Eukarya are things that we're very familiar with. They're plants, animals, um, all the, really the organisms that we see and touch and own on a daily basis. That all comes from the eukarya domain. Now prokarya is a little interesting. Um, prokarya is broken down further into two other um, subdivisions, if you will, and they are bacteria and archaea. I know that sounds funny. It's A R C H A E A. And some people might say it differently. And again, all these names can sometimes get a little overwhelming and difficult, and you'll hear several um, pronunciations of it. So say it as best you can. Um, I say it archaea because that's how I was taught. So bacteria and archaea have an interesting life story. Archaea used to be thought of as a bacteria, but as technology has improved and our um, ability to find these organisms in extreme places um, have shown us that we were 
grouping two separate organisms or groupings of organisms together when they really should be separate. And that's sort of what's happened here. So archaea was pulled out of the bacteria group and is now its own group. And these guys are pretty much considered the extremophiles, you may hear, um, because they are found in very extreme um, places on Earth. Um, deep air vents in the um, in the ocean, really in the deep dark depths of the ocean. Now that we have the ability to get there, we found, hey, here they are in these heat vents that are spewing up out of the earth um, deep in the ocean. These archaea live there. And um, likewise, there have been some that have been found in the extreme colds of the Arctic, deep, deep, deep in the ice. So when we would draw out ice cores, these little guys were showing up in our ice. And so they are their own special little grouping. Um, you may still find some people that group them together. You may even hear three domains. Um, you might hear bacteria, archaea, eukarya, prokarya. It depends on who you're talking to um, will determine which groups, which have been grouped together. So. For the purposes of this class, we have eukarya and prokarya as our two domains, and prokarya being further divided into bacteria and archaea. So again, these are just another way to combine organisms by like characteristics. And that's what you're seeing here on this uh, screen. This one actually looks like a family tree. Right? You've got branches and um, you've got branches of branches and things like that. And so it shows you um, the star in the upper right under animals. Um, that's where we fall, right? That is your eukarya group. All the brown is eukarya. Okay? That is your domain eukarya. We have animals, fungi, plants, ciliates, flagellates, all sorts of different things, slime molds, and um, these all have characteristics that are similar in some manner. There's something that groups these guys together. And if you look, that long brown branch that comes right, right down to the red circle, um, we had, this is the, um, the RK group here in red. Um, you can see where we've branched off from them, or they from us. Um, Archaea is said to be the, some of the oldest organisms ever found, um, so I guess we probably branched off from them. But you can see how we've got this tree structure all the way to the left, the blue organisms, those are your archaea, or those are your bacteria. So you've got your gram-positives, your spirochetes, your cyanobacteria. Um, there's just three branches here. That's what you're looking at. And uh, we've been able to separate some of these organisms out by looking at their genetic material. Uh, now that we have the ability to uh, map genes you know, for specific species, we can see, oh, hey, these guys now, what we were first thought of as together, are really are not. And that's kind of where that archaea came in again. So here's a cool slide. This is showing the phylogenetic tree of chimpanzees and humans, along with um, some other ape-like animals in between. So if you're looking at this, hey, there I am. I'm the human. I'm stuck smack dab in there between uh, chimpanzees and bonobos, right? Um, you can see how we have the same common ancestor. See where our three lines converge together um, at the base of what would be my line, the human line, um, that's how you can show people when they ask you, hey, thought we were like monkeys or something, you know, because people never know the difference between apes and monkeys, but here we are. So chimpanzees and bonobos, in this case, and humans all have a common ancestor. And you can see that humans are more closely related to chimpanzees than they are a gorilla. You can see from the mountain gorilla straight down to that same line that 
humans converge on and chimpanzees converge on, um, you can see how far apart we are, right? And then we're even further apart from the orangutan and the gibbon. And so you can see that the Bornean orangutan is actually a separate uh, type of orangutan from the Sumatran. Um, it has the different types of gorillas. Obviously, they're more closely related than um, than what a chimpanzee and a gorilla would be, or a gibbon and a bonobo. You know, um, so this is how you can read these genetic trees or phylogenetic trees. So based on genetics and a little bit of phylogeny, which again remember is your outward appearance, um, you can kind of break us up into groups um, without even knowing anything about each other. Uh, but this is depicting how we can say that our common ancestor and a chimpanzee's common ancestor, and really all of these great apes, all have the same common ancestor. And you can see, you can make that connection of how we're alike based on our tree. Now that we talked about how to classify specific organisms and how to understand what life is and what it isn't, um, we can move on to the process of science. So we're sort of backwards planning in a way. Um, we had to have this process of science before we could have any of those other classifications that we've come to. Because in order to come to those classifications, we had to actually employ the nature of science or the scientific inquiry. And so as this slide shows, it's a critical thinking process we're going to be judging the quality of information that we're receiving and then we're going to decipher um, whether or not we're going to include it in our final decision making process. Before we get into the specifics of the nature of science, if you will, or how to utilize science. Um, science is used as a way of looking at the natural world. We can communicate our experiences without bias, and without bias is key. Um, we focus only on testable ideas and observable phenomena. So in the next slide, I'll show you how those ideas come together. But an important note to make is that science is fact-based only. Science is never faith-based. So we touched on it in the last slide or two about evolutionary traits. Well, without delving into evolution as a study in this course, um, as a general rule, you hear, a lot of times you hear people say, um, I don't believe in evolution. I don't believe that that particular phenomena happened. Well, that unfortunately is inaccurate and an inaccurate phrase because you don't believe in science. Science is or it isn't. You believe in religion. You believe in your faith or you don't believe in your faith or whatever it is. Um, so that's the distinction and that's why um, it drives scientists batty when we hear uh, people talk about religion and science in the same breadth and why there's these heated arguments over such uh, a combination of these two ideas when really they're apples and oranges. So, um, you know, if you ever want to get anybody mad at you, <laughs> you can start saying, hey, this is what I learned. Science is fact-based and science is not faith-based. So uh, let's argue that about, you know, um, it's a good way to turn heads. <laughs> but it is true, and this is the, the basis of what we approach our scientific uh, realm 
in. We don't talk about faith because it's just apples and oranges. So the process of science usually starts with an observation. We've gone into the world, we've made an observation about something, and then we've created a test to see if we were correct. The observation should lead to what's called a hypothesis. Your hypothesis is a testable assumption um, based on your observation of what you think um, you should see every time you come upon this one instance in nature. So you make this observation and then you're going to test predictions based on this hypothesis and then you're going to um, gather your data and see if you're um, close or not. If we can falsify a study or your hypothesis, then you know you need to change your hypothesis or change the way you've created your study. And the whole idea behind studying, creating studies in such a way is so that other people can come behind you and use your methods to see if they get the same results. If, if they do, then more than likely what you've done is accurate. If they don't, well then there might be something wrong with them and the way they did their study, or there's something wrong with the way you did your study. So this is how all of science works pretty much. So now that we've talked about hypothesis, we can talk more about scientific theory, which is a set of principles that explain and predict a phenomenon that you've observed in nature or elsewhere in the lab or whatever. So a hypothesis has been verified by rigorous testing and it has now become a theory and the new theory can be used for making predictions about other phenomena. Okay. So we start with a hypothesis, that observation, the hypothesis, you're testing. Scientist after scientist after scientist has been able to recreate those exact studies that you've done and they've come up with the same outcomes that you have and now we have a scientific theory. And now I can use that theory to um, apply it towards other areas of interest that we may have. Here are two definitions for hypothesis and theory. So a hypothesis is a suggested, a suggested explanation or reasoned explanation of something that we've observed. Theory is tested, unifying explanation for a set of verified factors. So basically, study after study has been done, and now we have this theory. Bacteria such as these E. coli cells can cause deadly disease. Some viruses called bacteriophages can infect and kill bacteria. Researchers hypothesize that bacteriophages might protect laboratory mice from bacterial infections. They predicted that mice injected with deadly bacteria would not die if the mice were also injected with bacteriophages. To test their prediction, they first divided mice into two groups, a control group and an experimental group. Each group contained 15 female mice that were all the same age and from the same strain. The control group was injected with a deadly strain of E. coli bacteria. The experimental group was injected with E. coli and with bacteriophage. Within 32 hours, all the control group mice died. The mice in the experimental group remained healthy. 
The scientists concluded that their hypothesis was correct. An injection of bacteriophage can protect lab mice against bacterial infection. Here are some examples of some theories that you may have heard of before. The actual experiment that you come up with to test your hypotheses um, are pretty important. You want to make sure that you have a simple enough experiment that it won't take a lot of time and energy, um, but will still provide enough material to answer those questions uh, that you had in your hypotheses. So basically, the experiment part is to support or falsify your prediction, which came from your hypotheses and your observations, um, using testing only one variable at a time, if possible. Um, it is very difficult to whittle down an experiment so that only one variable exists. Um, often there are several variables at a time and through your statistical analysis you'll be able to account for that. But um, in an ideal world you would set up an experiment in such a way that you're only testing one variable at a time. So here's an example of an experiment uh, using these butterflies. So your question or observation basically is, why does a peacock butterfly flick its wings? Good question. Didn't know it did, but let's find out why. Okay, so you have two hypotheses. You have um, exposing wing spots scare off predators and wing sounds scare off predators. Your two predictions from these hypotheses are that individuals without spots are eaten more often and individuals without sound are eaten more often. It's possible it's one or the other or it's possible it's both. Let's see what happens. So we have number one here, create a hypothesis. Spot and sound protect butterflies. Number two, make the prediction. Birds will eat butterflies without spots or sounds. Devise an experiment. Modify spots and take away sounds. And last but not least, observation, which would be C above in this table. Um, so. Let's see, the number that survived was 100% in that first row because they had spots and sound. And that would be our control group because we knew that they had spots and sounds. We want to know what happens when those things are taken away. So the experimental group is going to be the ones that we take the spots away or take the sound away or take both away. And so you can see um, those with spots and no sound, um, uh, they survived 100% as well. And then your two pink lines, one has no spots but sound, and one has no spots, no sound. So the ones with no spot, no sound, uh, the fewest amount of those butterflies survived. So it looks to me that spots and sound are very important and perhaps spots over sound. Spots are more important than, than wing sound is the way I'm reading this. So this is just an example of how we can set up 
our experiment. I want to leave you with this one final slide, uh, Laws of Nature. And basically, they are a generalization that describes a consistent and universal natural phenomenon for which we do not have a complete scientific explanation. And the example is gravitational attraction. So there are some things out there that we can suppose that maybe our experiments have not quite thoroughly explained what is actually taking place um, or that we've not been able to come up with an experiment to test what is taking place. So gravitational attraction is one such law of nature. My colleague always likes to say um, in the realm of science, because we can get so narrowly focused on science that we forget that there's the rule of life, and that is to treasure every moment with all your loved ones. So that concludes your week one lecture. Don't forget to read your chapter one. Don't forget to take your quiz based on the chapter, and don't forget to participate in your discussion forum. Make sure you get in your first post by Wednesday evening and your final post by Sunday. I will also see you Wednesday evening at 6.30 in the Life Science Building, uh, Lab Room 106, and we will have our first lab, and we'll get to know each other. and. Um, Hopefully, we'll have a lot of fun this semester. I look forward to getting to know you, and uh, thanks for listening.